And as we continue to grow in trusting in our God alone, turn with me to the 33rd Psalm, uh, Psalm 33, the 33rd Psalm. As we continue to worship the Lord this morning through our time of scripture reading and prayer, Psalm 33. reads as follows, shout for joy in the Lord, all you righteous, praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre, and make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song, uh, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. The word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Uh, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings to counsel the nations uh, to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive from famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust In his holy name, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let us pray together. Father, so much is running through this psalm. There's great emotion that is based on the truth concerning our God, for you are upright. All of your work is done in faithfulness. You're God who's a love of righteousness and justice because you are a righteous God and a just God. The whole earth is full of the steadfast love of our Lord, even more so as we see that in the very person of Jesus Christ, your Son. With that being said, praise is a fitting for the upright. It is a fitting attire for your redeemed ones who trust in you, who also recognize you as the Creator and calling all men and women to fear you, O great God, Yahweh, the faithful and covenant-keeping God. We ask this morning, God, by your great strength and your power, that you will equip your people to rejoice in you, to trust in your steadfast and enduring love. And do we not witness that in the person of Jesus Christ, your Son? Therefore, we can say with joy that our soul will wait for you because our help is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray this morning, God, that your steadfast love will be seen, Lord, as we proclaim the gospel, that sinners will come to know you, but that as your people we will trust in you in this broken and crooked world in realizing that our salvation is not in the the arm or the power, the mind, the might of kings, of princes, presidents, and leaders, but our hope and our strength is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. May our confidence rest in you in this unwavering society. May our confidence rest in you and you alone, the supreme authority, the supreme power, but also God. We know that according to your purposes, we, we are able to trust in a God who we know loves us greatly in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are able to wait on you with anticipation. We also to wait on you actively trusting in you and preparing for the coming of your son, Jesus Christ. We are also able to wait by doing deeds uh, for your glory and for your honor. And when we wait on you, O God of heaven, we wait for no one else. Our eyes are fixed upon you. And even though the world may vacillate, may we, Lord, be steadfast in trusting in a God who is trustworthy and eternally faithful 
Therefore, God of heaven, to you be all of the praise, the glory, the exaltation as your people grow in their trust in a God who can be trusted until now and to eternity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated at this time. It's always a joy to read the word of God and be reminded of our God's steadfast love and his mercy that endures forever. Uh, we always want to remember that, beloved. Uh, we are in a world of instability and insecurity. There's much happening around us. Uh, we can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you flustered when you watch the news or as you watch the news? I'm too caught up in the good news uh, to be perturbed with the world's news. Uh, God's news to mankind is always good even when things look bad, because our hope, as we sang in Psalm 62, and our trust is to be anchored in the supreme ruler, and that is our King, Jesus Christ. We're getting ready to take our offering this morning. We ask that the ushers will uh, come forward in a moment as we worship our uh, God together in giving. And this moment is no different from any other. We are called to give joyfully. We're called to give joyfully because we have been given the Spirit's joy in salvation and our joy should be found in Jesus Christ. So whether it is uh, the resources God has given us or the time he has given us, and you would notice I didn't say your resources or our resources, your time or our time. It is God's resources. It is God's time uh, given to us as stewards to exercise uh, his biblical wisdom uh, as we have been given those material resources and this temporal time on this earth to lay eternal treasures in heaven. As we do so for the glory of God, it is eternal. Uh, it is something that will be stored up in heaven. So even in our given, beloved, let's remember that this is an opportunity for us to lay treasures in heaven. Pray with me. Beautiful Savior, it is in your name we come to the Father. Uh, asking that he alone be glorified as we give together. This very moment is a time you have ordained for us to give to the praise of your glory. May your people rejoice, and may we all give with thanksgiving, and may we give with joy, and may we give with this great sense of peace. Uh, may we give, a Father, not grudgingly, but cheerfully. May we give as an act of sincere and devoted worship to you. For this time, it's no different from all the other times of corporate gatherings. This is an opportunity for us corporately to worship together and given in thanksgiving to you for your provision. But also, Lord, it's an opportunity for us to give to a work that you've called us to do so that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ may be echoed and permeate throughout this local community and if it's your will, throughout the earth. All of this, God, so that you and you alone may be the supreme object of praise and worship. Amen. is my 
pray to the God of our salvation. In the name of our Savior, we come to you, our righteous Father, asking that by your divine and indwelling spirit, your sacred truths will be united to our mind as we endeavor to take on not only the character of Christ, but to further develop the mind, and the thinking of Christ. May the power and the presence of your blessed Spirit work among us, within us, through us, your powerful and enduring word, that it may inform us and conform us to Christ Jesus, your Son. Amen. Amen. Beloved, turn with me to... God's words, 
in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter. We're discussing this great redeeming theme of freedom from condemnation, particularly in the first four verses of Romans 8 that reads as follows, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that or so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We are outlining this passage, uh, first of all, with a general conclusion, the general conclusive statement, and it says, you are free, you are free in Christ. You are free, therefore, uh, to live. And then we have broken that down into some smaller components, beginning with the first verse that says definitively that you are free from condemnation. And why is that needed? Why was that required? And it is very simple, that we are all condemned before God under the first Adam. We are guilty before God. And remember, we're not guilty for sinning. We are, first of all, guilty as sinners. It is who we are. We are sinners, and therefore, because we are sinners, we sin. So we are, we are categorically characterized and finally identified onto the first and in the first Adam as sinners. So we are condemned onto the first Adam as sinners in and through him. Therefore, we are in need of another representative, a perfect one. And that is why Christ came. We are free from condemnation that is guilty of being sinners by nature. We are free from condemnation because of Christ. And because of Christ and our faith in him, God's verdict has been unconditionally reached. And because it is an unconditional verdict, it is reached by a God who cannot lie. You can never be penalized under the first Adam anymore. And that is the beauty of justification by faith. Those in whom God declares righteous because they have placed their faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ and turned away from their sins and turned to God and trusting in God through Christ Jesus, they are never condemned before God. It's eternal. And that is what verse 1 says. You are condemned for those specifically who are in union with Christ Jesus. Well, how is that possible? We develop this further in from verses 2 and 3. First of all, you are free by the power of the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. This is the power, the life-giving, life-changing power of the Holy Spirit who grants us life in Christ Jesus. Not only that, it is possible because you are free by God. In verse 3, through Christ Jesus, so God the Father has purposed your freedom through Christ. And in verse 3 it says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. In fact, verse 3 literally reads, For God, for God has done what the law could not do by sending His own Son. And the bottom line is that God condemned sin in the flesh uh, through the sacrificial offering of His Son, uh, Jesus Christ God was able to condemn your sin through the body of His Son, Jesus Christ, once and for all. So we are saying here that Christ came to offer Himself 
as a sacrifice in your place. He came as a sin offering. And so God judged sin in and through the perfect body of the sacrificial Savior. We did note last week, it's so important for us to remember this and realize that the sacrifice of Christ was, first of all, primarily for our sins. There are secondary benefits, but those secondary benefits can almost be achieved without being saved. You can live a relatively decent life without being saved. In a worldly sense, you can have some forms of happiness in this life, and oftentimes the gospel is shaped as a happenstance event. You being saved, you will just so happen to be happy. Now, we're not denying that there's some elements of that in Christianity, but you can achieve some of that even as an unbeliever. But no one can be freed from the penalty of sin and the power of sin apart from the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ. And that is, dearly beloved, what this text is stressing. Now, the Bible does not diminish how we should live life before God on this, on this earth. But first of all, the most important need must be dealt with, and that is the problem of our sinfulness. Well, verse 4 is where we find ourselves this morning There is a goal, and the goal is this. You are free to obey. You are now set free to obey. And to that final point, we say in verse 3, that the goal is achieved by Christ for you. In verse 4, the goal is achieved by Christ for you. What happened in verse 3, in fact, verse 4 is a continuation, but it's a continuation with a purpose statement, which is a very important uh, conclusion to what Paul is saying in this first paragraph in verses 1 through 4, that the goal is achieved by Christ for you, and Christ's righteous accomplishment is where your obedience is to be founded. So the text says in your freedom to obey in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now we need to look at this section in at least two different uh, divisions here but it's a united truth. Remember that we're just separating it for the sake of the instruction. But what you have here is you have a purpose what we would call a purpose clause. This is the the immediate objective with also evidence. So you have the purpose clause, the righteous requirement of the law being fulfilled, but you also have the evidence of the fulfillment of the righteous requirement in you. The evidence is who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So in verse four, there's a purpose clause with evidence. There's a purpose clause with evidence. And the evidence is seen in your walking, in how you walk according to the Spirit and not the flesh. But first of all, you must realize in this statement, the purpose for Christ's life and death for you was so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in you. The fulfillment of that righteous requirement having been met by Jesus Christ. And your life gives evidence to that requirement being met based on the conduct of your life. It doesn't save you. Remember that. This is a description of someone who is actually free from condemnation. A free man or a free woman in Christ conducts themselves in accordance to what this freedom actually is. So this is not even an exhortation, it is evidence, it is just a description. It is saying, you see a free man or a woman in Christ, you will see them by their conduct. You will see them by how they live. This fulfillment in us leads to a fulfillment in our lives of a holy conduct. We'll elaborate on that some more because I would remind you this is often either overlooked or set aside because of the the hazard, I would say, of overemphasizing one aspect of God's 
redeeming and justifying work over another, where there's an overemphasis of you've got to do good deeds in order to, to be a Christian. And because that is emphasized and stated wrongly, we ignore it altogether and we, we go on the air of just pure doctrine of justification only and no practical application. And that is actually idolatry because the scripture does not paint it that way whatsoever. And obviously that, is, that can happen whenever you systematize theology, when you talk about one doctrine to the detriment of another. But if you allow the text to speak for itself, Paul is presenting doctrines here, theology here, not for us to be in a laboratory, but it's for life. You've got to know the doctrine in order to live appropriately or to know that you're actually living in accordance to the truth that has been presented in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now verse 4, what is the requirement of the law? We have to look at that just briefly to, to gain some insight as to what that is. And I want to present to you at least two stipulations uh, in reference to this righteous requirement, at least two of them. And the, you know that whenever it comes to God and us or Christ and us, there's going to be the positive and the negative. You know the negative is us. It's, it's what we bring to the table. We always have to talk about what we bring to the table. And when we come to God and trusting him, we know and you know that everything you brought to the table was just wrong. It was a perversion of, a distortion of, a, a, a straying from, a deviating from, deception, deceit, sinfulness. So there's the negative, but there's the positive that we also want to bring to the table. This is what the sacrifice of Christ has accomplished. Well, first of all, the negative one here in this fulfillment, this fulfillment on Christ was necessary because you failed to meet the perfect demands of God's law. You failed to meet the perfect demands of God's law. The righteous requirement de demanded absolute perfection and allegiance to God in its totality. And according to Romans chapter 3 in God's divine courtroom, we are all charged under sin. Therefore, there is none who is righteous. There is none who understands. No one seeks for God. And if man's duty an aim, an objective, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We have failed from the onset, and we continue to because we're not seeking after God. We have turned aside. We have turned away from God. No one does good, in verse 12 of Romans 3, even with our words, our tongue, our mouth. What we say is contradictory to God. It's invariance toward Him. It's hostility towards Him. Our feet is swift toward evil. And we certainly do not know the path of peace. And so we stand in God's courtroom, and as the law is read out to us, the entire body of the law holds us guilty. So we are unfaithful to the law. We are unwilling to keep and uphold God's law. And the only time we would use God's law is if it is to our advantage. Remember in Romans, the seventh chapter, that we will use the law of God as a platform, as a beachhead to carry out our evil. Well, so that is the negative. Well, here's the positive. Christ, on the other hand, and Christ alone, fulfilled the perfect requirement of the law. He did so through his perfect life. And that is the positive side of the fulfillment. Christ did this in his life, which you could not do in your life. Well, we know that it is only possible for Christ to be our Redeemer if he is perfect, for him to be the sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice. You go back to the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be unblemished, and that is exactly who Christ was for us. Well, here's another one, and it is a connection in connection to the first, and it is this, the, the second negativity, according to this fulfillment, is that failure to keep the law according to God's final ruling resulted in death. It resulted in death, and this particular death pronounced a curse upon you. So now we are all cursed in Adam, there is no way for anyone to reason, to work, 
to righteous, self-righteous their way out of this. And so a failure to keep the law, we are now cursed. We are dead in sin. Now we're cursed by God. But for you, the positive side is this. Christ's sacrifice on the cross meant that that curse was also credited to him. So Christ satisfied the law's just demand by his death in your place. He took on the curse of the law for you. So here you are worthy of death, curse. And when you look at the word of God, it's very clear that Christ became a curse for you. In Galatians, for example, you can note that. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do so? By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now notice what the Apostle Paul says at the end of verse 14 of Galatians 3. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And that then is a, one of the key bases for the re righteous requirement of the law. You deserve death by being hung on that cross to be shamed, to be scoffed, to be mocked, an example to others of what you deserved. But Scripture says Christ took it all on for you. And therefore, it's a once and for all fulfillment. Another point to be made, I showed you the positive and the negative. Let's move forward and to make sure that we clarify in verse 4 that this is, first of all, an alien fulfillment of righteousness, what we would call forensic. First of all, God declares this. It, it is a decision that he has made based on the truth that he is fully satisfied with the work of his son, Jesus Christ, for you. And therefore, he's able to take what Christ has done for you and all of Christ's righteousness, credit it all to your account. And what was on your account, this sin, this curse, this death, this damnation, God was able to remove that from your account, but he credited that on the cross of Jesus Christ. Another point to be made to show that this is, first of all, forensic, but it is not without evidence. So important to bring the balance here because the text brings the balance. And we dare not eliminate the other aspect of this truth, the other side of the coin, because of uh, those who falsely teach a works-based righteousness without, without grounding it in the work of Jesus Christ. Nor will we be guilty of speaking of this justification and this radical grace without this sanctifying grace. We dare not do so. But we must look at the passive activity first because the initiative that God took on the behalf of Christ his son establishes the power and the ability to live a life that is in accordance to the righteousness that has been imputed to your account. In fact, the word fulfilled here in this section is a passive activity, which means, first of all, you are the recipient of that uh, fulfillment in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And of course, this, this word might here doesn't mean it's going to happen for some and not others, but this is conditional upon your faith in Christ alone, I believe, that this refers to the faith that necessitates it. In other words, you must believe that this is true. You must believe that what God has done in Christ is the only sufficient means for you to be declared righteous. You would say, well, there, there, there has to be other ways. There has to be a wideness to God's mercy. As one man so arrogantly and falsely, heretically said years ago, it's Robert Schuller who's no longer with us. I wonder when he stood before God how narrow he knew that mercy was. The, the mercy of God is rich, but it's only in one person, it's in Jesus Christ. It is a rich mercy, but it is not wideness to the point that you can get it any other way. It must come through the person of Christ. That is why if we, to be justified, will add works to it, it is no longer justification. 
we must allow this text to speak clearly that it first begins with God's work in Christ and the faith is the instrument that lays a hold of God's promises. promises now the subjective side is this the subjective side is how the holy spirit applies it to your life and the impact of that truth is so substantial when you look at this here is why you are now seen by god as christ was to the father you are now seen by god as what christ was to the father in upholding the father's law upholding the Father's righteous standard, the perfect righteousness of God credited to you. Therefore, this is forensic. This is forensic. This is forensic. You are seen by God as perfectly obedient to the law because of Christ. Christ's perfect obedience is credited to you. You are now once again blessed with another supreme spiritual blessing. You are in Christ, and when God sees you, he sees Christ. Because when you're justified, you are robed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when God sees the cross, he sees your curse, your sin, your guilt, your death, nailed to the cross once and for all. And so this objective truth, which is true, is also a subjective reality. The objective side of what Christ has done for you becomes a truth that God wants you to not only know, but to experience. It is real. It is living. One to know and experience until the coming of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the subjective reality is based on the objective and final work of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes this truth real and life-changing. It's because of what Christ has done. So if I were to put it this way, your in Christness, your union with Christ means all Christ is for you. The Spirit of God pours out in you. So the first and important overall point from verse 4 is that the imputed fulfillment of God's righteous standard done by Christ is unconditionally given to you as a gift, as a gift of God. And that purpose has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Now here's a part of obedience that we will begin to work toward. The evidence of this objective work is seen in the fruit of a person's life. Remember, your living doesn't save you. But your life in Christ gives evidence to the fact that you're no longer condemned. So the last line in verse 4 identifies those in whom this righteous requirement has been fulfilled. So this is what I would call evidence of the fulfillment. The evidence of the fulfillment, the end of verse 4 describes what that fulfillment means. And in fact, the end of verse 4 just begins. And then you start with verse 5 and move forward, begins to describe what that looks like in our lives. And Paul will use obviously contradicting truths when it comes to being in the spirit or in the flesh to show you that there are two realities, but you're no longer subjected to that realm of the flesh. You are now under the authority and the power of the life-giving spirit of the living God based on your in Christness. So this describes what that fulfillment looks like in your life. And remember, here's another important point as we move toward the, that second part of verse 4. It is presently in this life. You're still battling against sin. 
There will be days of tremendous and moments of tremendous loss because of the sins that you've given into. But the power of the Holy Spirit can never be marginalized because of your sin. He is a spirit, beloved, of great power. But there's an exercise that must take place of a diligent mind that is pursuing Christ's likeness, but also a life that is walking in accordance to it. We, we are called to submit to this truth, but nevertheless, the evidence is clear in Scripture. It is a life of obedience in this life, a lifetime of a spirit-empowered pattern, a spirit-empowered pattern or consistency of walking according to the Spirit. Another way, I think we can encapsulate this, the purpose statement as we work into the end of verse 4 to see how it describes someone in whom the law has been fulfilled is to say this, Christ's life of perfect obedience was in harmony with God's perfect requirement. His perfect sacrifice was in harmony with God's perfect demand. demands. This is all imputed or credited to you by the Spirit of God where Christ's righteousness becomes yours. His obedience to the law becomes yours. So therefore, you'll never be condemned because of that. At the same token, that truth is visible because there's a new way to walk. There's a new pattern of life. It is no longer associated with the pattern and the dominion of sin. So this is a description of someone who has been who was once in darkness, but it's now in light. So it's not without evidence. Those who receive this benefit, according to verses one uh, through the beginning of verse four, what has been credited to you is now what you identified with or by. So this righteousness that is alien also becomes a living righteousness. I mean, notice what the text says in verses 3 and 4. You put them together. For God has done with the law weakened by the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin. And remember, uh, Paul, when he spoke of sin here in this text, remember, not, not just a penalty, Maybe you enjoy the charges being dropped so you can be free and do what you've always done before. Maybe that's what the criminal wants. All charges are dropped. You're free from your imprisonment. Bail has been set. You no longer have to pay the bail. You're free. That's true. But in this case, it is not only the penalty but what is also stressed, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is the power. It is the power. Sin no longer has rights over you. It may attempt to usurp those, that truth. It may attempt to assert rights that it longer has. I mean, sin is invasive. Sin is not gentle at all. Sin doesn't ask for permission. It continues to to attack your thoughts, your intentions, and your motive. So we're not denying its presence is there. What we're saying is the power of God is there. Now, in verse 4, you also should observe the seamless connection between what God has done in Christ and what that looks like in your life. That this imputed, this credited righteousness also becomes an imparted one, which means it's one that you live out. So verse 4, the end of verse 4, is a reference to a new standard, a new way of living. Paul called it in Romans chapter 6. So this is nothing, this is not a new territory. He said it is newness of life. That was mentioned throughout chapter 6. It was also mentioned in the 7th chapter that we're serving in the new way of the Spirit. Well, even in verse 4, look at this with me, according to the Spirit. According to the Spirit, the idea here, it seems to be referring to a particular standard, a particular standard, a particular way of living. Remember the word walk here, and 
the apostle is saying who walk not according. The word walk here is actually a present activity. The idea is saying that it's those who are walking. It's a present continuous activity of your conduct. That there is a standard of living that is consistent with what Christ accomplished for you. This standard of living is consistent with this righteous fulfillment. You're walking in accordance to that standard. You're walking in accordance to the Spirit of God. That new standard has been placed before you by Christ through the Spirit of God. Therefore, the pattern of life, the conduct in your life, the way that you live corresponds to the Spirit of God who has given you a new nature. Now think about the Spirit of God. Think about this new nature. Think about who the Spirit of God is. And think about the consistency of life. Remember, beloved, this is not perfection, but think about this very carefully. The text is saying, this is what the fulfillment of Christ looks like in your day-to-day living subjectively. This is what the world should see. This is what fellow believers should see, that you are now walking differently. Your life is in accordance to the Holy Spirit. Now we say Holy Spirit, therefore we know that the Holy Spirit is holy. Therefore your walk is to be according to that pattern, that standard of holiness. If he's holy, your thoughts, your actions, your motives biblically are to be conformed to the Holy Spirit and His work. There is a a passage of Scripture, I think, that helps illustrate that is in Ephesians chapter 4. Just turn there briefly with me. Because the Apostle Paul makes a very important statement here when it comes to the daily life in the Spirit, particularly we would call this progressive sanctification. But Paul makes an important point. In verse 20 of Ephesians 4, Paul says that that is not the way you learn Christ. You know that if you are in Christ, you do not live according to the futility of your mind. That's how the ungodly world walks. You notice the word walk in verse 17. Paul says you are not darkened in your understanding anymore. Because you're no longer alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that was in you that is still in those who do not believe. And he says this is because of the hardness of their heart. He says they've also become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Well, how did we learn Christ? Even within The doctrine of justification, this good news concerning Christ, is this, that when any man is in Christ, Paul says, assuming that you have heard about this Christ and were taught in him, in verse 21, as the truth is in Christ, this is what you were taught. He's not really telling us to do this now. He's going to tell us to do that now in verse 25. This is what he said was done. You were taught to put off your old self. Why? Because it belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And then he says presently in verse 23, which I think corresponds more to verse 25 and moving forward, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There is a new standard. You were also taught to put on the new self. Why? Because it's created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and in holiness, and that true righteousness and holiness is to be seen in the person of Jesus Christ. So even as you examine the body of Scripture, there is something to be said that you were called to put the old self off. Go back to Romans Go back to Romans, the sixth chapter. Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
in Ephesians, he, he gives us a, a rich explanation of you were told that these attitudes must be put off negatively, the old self. That is when you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you are turning away from that as you are robed in Christ's righteousness to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, but also now you're learning how to put on the new self. That's what you're seeing in Romans 8, verse 24, a description of someone who's no longer alienated from the life of God, someone who is no longer in sin and condemnation, is that there is a difference in their direction. So this is a description, beloved. This is a description for those who are in Christ Jesus and no longer condemned. And let me just warn that this is not saying at all you will never sin. That's not the point at all. Nor is this achievement-based, meaning that it, you must achieve it before this no condemnation is really yours. He's saying, no, 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 as a result of no longer being condemned, here they are. Look at these Christians walking in accordance with the Spirit. It's almost an observation he's making. This is how you can determine someone who is no longer condemned. The standard of righteousness, they continue to pursue it. This is not works righteousness. This is a result of Christ's work of righteousness on your behalf. You are now living out that truth of his fulfilled righteousness in you. So now that becomes the habit of your life. Your, your regular and daily habit is in harmony with that standard. So important to, I think, this text stresses it by implication that you know that there's no way to live this way unless the Spirit of God dwells in you. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. But to that point, you, can, you cannot live any other way if He dwells in you. He's going to lead you to the Word of God, through the Word of God, in paths of righteousness. The Holy Spirit who dwells in us leads us this way. Therefore, you cannot live any other way if He dwells in you. And here is where we exhort believers to pay close attention, as Paul told Timothy, to your life and doctrine. You notice even in those exhortations, because once again, there's... At, at times, the overemphasis of doctrine, pay attention to it. But then the other side, there's overemphasis of life. Live it, holy, do it, love it. And then you're like, well, how? How? It's the doctrine. Scripture says pay attention to both. Because the doctrine is the, the essential truth, right? But your life testifies to the power of that essential truth. Your life gives evidence to the power of of that life-changing truth. Beloved, doctrine is not to be stored on the shelf of our minds. It is for life. It is for living. It is to transform you. It is to inform you in order that it may transform you. To begin to, to speak to your mind the Word of God as the Holy Spirit enables your will. So here we have to think carefully about what it means to be in Christ to be justified, declared righteous, but also condemnation-free, that our lives will correspond to it because it gives evidence to the fact that we are actually free in Christ. Well, think about just on the natural level the tendencies that you may have. And uh, most of your tendencies or, or habits, if not all of them, are typically wrong. And, but here's the point I'm making. It's natural for you to do wrong. Doing wrong and sin is who you are. It's a part of your dynamic. You were born that way. Now think about patterns and standards when you reflect on the Holy Spirit, who knows only holiness and absolute perfection. Why do you think the correlation between this fulfillment and your life makes so much sense? What do you think he leads God's people to do? He places before us Christ. The perfect example, Christ, an ex and a perfect example and a perfection that we'll never achieve. But he sets Christ before us as he enables us to live 
with the mind and the attitude of Christ. And that is what you find here. You not only get the benefits of Christ, you not only see the example of Christ, but you also have the power of the Holy Spirit that enables you to pursue Christ's likeness. So for those who are in Christ, your pattern of life is now in accordance to the Spirit of God. And this walk begins with the standard of righteousness, this new direction for your life, this new course of life that God has called you to. Beloved, remember, as you hear the word of God, you think about Romans chapter 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you heard the gospel, the gospel called for the fact that your mind is going to have to be renewed because when you surrendered to God, submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ by faith, beloved, you gave him your body and everything that involved your body, including your mind, your thoughts. That's why Paul can tell the believers, let this mind, this way of thinking be in you, which is already yours by virtue of your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to exercise that by thinking the thoughts of Christ according to Scripture. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in us. So your motives and desires will be conformed to Christ the more your mind is renewed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And remember, remember, this is an encouragement, encouragement but a warning. The Word of God is not a treatise of systematic theology. It is God's Word to man that is revealed by the Spirit of God through human instruments so that we can know God and live responsibly before Him. So if we ever get stuck on the elevator of the ivory tower, and we're always at the top floor, and we never come down to ground level and live it out, beloved, I'm sorry, but that is simply not Christianity at all. It is not Christianity at all. Because let me just remind you, the devil knows Scripture. And he has yet, and he never will be saved. It is the power of the Spirit of God and the Word of God and But there is now the diligence of exercising the mind that is now free, because your mind is now free to think biblical thoughts. And in thinking biblical thoughts, you are also free in your body to live a biblical life, a Christ-like life. So your motives and your desires will be conformed to Christ. And if you have not been to that place of gotten there, even the minutest decisions are weighed in the presence of that truth of your life in the Spirit. The course of your day will be evaluated from Scripture and how the Spirit leads. You will know. You will know. When you examine your life according to the Scripture and, and the Spirit of God, you seek Him to bring those truths to you. You will know how your day has deviated. You will know how your week has deviated. As the light of God's Word shines upon you. So, beloved, in this text, remember, this is a description. Your living is based on a different standard, one that is according to the Spirit and not the world. You are no longer bound to sin and the flesh. And the flesh, in this particular instance, and many times throughout this passage, is the, the person that is contrary and hostile to God. And hostility to God is seen in hatred and disobedience. But you're no longer that way. You're now submitted. Paul says you have not learned Christ that way if you truly learned Christ. So now we assume that you have, and if you have, there's a difference. There's a difference. The Holy Spirit brings Christ front and center stage, not just in you, but before you. Well, let's think about a little bit more about walking according to the Spirit. Let me... See if I can phrase that to help us think through this, because these are moments that we have to think deeply and prayerfully. But walking according to the Spirit is to live in His power, consistently according to the way He teaches and leads, and under the influence and total guidance that He, that he gives. It is a daily, habitual, constant exercise of yielding the, the mind, the will, the heart, the affections to the Holy Spirit. Beloved, that's not a passive activity. It's an active duty. Paul says, you walk according to the Spirit. There's a sense in which you must exercise 
this freedom that you have in Christ by daily submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit for the entirety of your life. There is a dependency, therefore, on his power, his instruction from the word, his leading, his influence, and his guidance. And that's exactly what you receive. But you are called to be mindful of it. If not, it's a poor description of someone who is condemnation free. Let me just say it this way. It is contradictory to the freedom and condemnation to live as if you're condemned by the sin and how you practice sin. Do you love sin? Do you enjoy it? I didn't ask you how alluring, how much it tempts you. That's, that's not relevant. So we, we, we are all tempted, the temptation strong. I'm talking about your love for it. Because no matter how strong that desire is, it is still you who wanted to do it. At the end of every sin is moi and thee. Sin needs a personality. It needs an instrument. It needs a person who thinks through the process of sinning. But here is where in Christ the power of the Holy Spirit works, but there must be the diligent, willful determination on your part to stay submitted and in commitment to the Holy Spirit's work. And here's where it gets difficult for us. You ever been in a moment where you really wanted to exercise that sin because you felt like you needed it? That a plain word of prayer and rejoicing isn't enough for your friendly neighbor who may keep you up all hours of the night? And gracious words aren't sufficient? Have you ever had those thoughts uh, in your mind? That's where we cast those thoughts down because they exalt themselves above the name of Christ. Paul says you did not learn Christ this way. Christ is not some explosive, low temperamental, angry beast. He's not some wild and uncontrollable man. You have not learned Christ this way. Uh, Christ was not subjected, nor did he allow himself to be subjected to the world's strategies or the world's actions even as the world acted against him he still responded exactly how the father would respond that's how you have learned to christ but here we're in these crucial moments in our lives we says well i want the lord to work but i'm struggling but think about how often you just absolutely love your sin and you say nothing of it But beloved, that, to be in that pattern is to still give the appearance. I'm not saying that you are to give the appearance that you're still condemned. A condemnation free Christian is a Christian who's free to think like Christ, to live as Christ lived, to enjoy the relationship adopted sons in this union with Christ Jesus. So this, beloved, is the reality. Walking according to to the spirit and not the flesh, this flesh that is grounded by sin, loving sin, living in sin. Now, according to the spirit, you are no longer grounded in sin, but you're grounded in the forensic righteousness of Jesus Christ that leads to a living day-to-day pursuit of progressive righteousness. So the righteousness that Christ has worked for you becomes the righteousness that the spirit of God works in you. The Spirit of God works in you. Remember, beloved, this is not a demand. This is not a command. This is a description. This is evidence of a condemnation-free man or woman. He or she is a Christ, a God-pursuing man or woman. This is all accomplished by the Spirit of God who not only gives us life and salvation, but he also quickens, gives life to our mortal body to pursue righteousness. So the fruit of this freedom is seen in the fact that you are walking your life, the pattern of your life is that you're walking according to the Spirit. In fact, that's the inevitable outcome of Christ's glorious and victorious 
death on the cross for you is that you are able to live in this victorious life of pursuing godliness. Godliness. Now, a, a hazard, and another hazard we have to look out for, and I, I realize that, and this is an important point, I, I stressed it earlier, is that it is easy to enter into the realm of legalism. But that happens in this text when you put the, the latter before the former, the latter being the end of verse 4. And as I said before, there's a typical emphasis of the living. That's legalism without what Christ has done for us. But if this is based on the finished work of Christ, we live because he lives. We love because he first loved us. It is important to see the one who took initiative to first secure salvation, but not only that, the benefits of it that we can love God and love others is because he has poured his love in our hearts by his spirit. It's when it gets reversed it becomes a problem. But to eliminate, to me, to eliminate the fruit is to, to in one sense, attack the tree. It's to speak negatively and condescendingly towards the tree. And we dare not do that. The conduct of your life is a reflection of the fact that you're no longer condemned. That you're no longer condemned. But you are in Christ Jesus. Think about this. We haven't gotten there yet, but even in the later chapter of, of Romans 8, you look at adoption. Even the language of adoption indicates that you're no longer associated with the old family. And you know the old family was a family of, of sin. Uh, the, the crazy family that, that sinned all day, sinned all night. You ever had people like that that you know? They don't work. They don't have a job. They sin all day, sin all night. Their life is like a, a, just an ongoing party. You're no longer in that family if you're ever part of that. You're no longer in that family. You're in a family of, of divine, uh, gracious love. But in that family of love and grace, you are also being taught lovingly how to live as someone who is in that family. Therefore, the practice of those who are in Christ is, is never separated from the promise of eternal life as a result of being in Christ. Another illustration of this, this way of living in obedience, you, uh, we don't have time, but in Romans 13, verse, verses 8 through 10, you can just jot that down. Paul talks about the fulfillment of the law is loving God and loving others. That's going to be in the context of the, the local fellowship of, of believers. But not only that, it's also going to, to be evident as we deal with the unbelieving world, those who are enemies or uh, hostile uh, before us. It says in verse Nine, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So you begin to see that there's a change even in our affection. We begin to love others. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. There are practical ways in seeing how we walk according to the Spirit. We were once haters of God, but now we are able to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all our soul, and with all of our strength, not in our own power, but the Holy Spirit enables us to do so. Paul says this in Galatians 5, 13 and 14. He says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But please remember that initial fulfillment does not rest with you or in you. Because prior to this, you were hostile, enemies of God, enemies of one another, which means you hated God and you hated others unless it was to your advantage. So by nature, you were born in sin and fixated on personal interest. You were corrupt. But now in Christ, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, begins to dwell in you, and he informs you on how it is and what it looks like to love God and to love others. He teaches you what it means to obey all of the commands of Jesus Christ. And that will continue until glory. So, beloved, see the purpose in verse 4, the beginning of verse 4, and then see the end as a descriptive element of this fulfillment. That the former 
the alien righteousness leads to the latter, a life of progressive righteousness, obedience to the Father, love for others. One who's justified, therefore, lives a justified life, an upright life of obedience to the Word of God. Now, you recall Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, once again, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So therefore, there's a relationship now with being in Christ and obeying him as a sign of love. Beloved, that's what the Holy Spirit brings to us. As you're walking, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. But how easy it is to rejoice in the forensic, but not the practical. But as I remind you, they are in harmony here in this text. They're in harmony in this text. The text. So the fruit of no condemnation, beloved, the, the, the description of this no condemnation, the evidence is this new walk, this new standard of living that is no longer the same associated with the old. First Peter chapter 2, you can jot it down, but First Peter chapter 2 verse 24, I just want you to, to, to see uh, the relationship between the two. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And Peter says, here's why, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. There's no separation, therefore, between a justified life and a life that is justified now being sanctified until the day of glory where it will be perfectly sanctified. So I remind you before, there are, there are extremes, but I, I am safe in standing on this reality of, of Scripture that God is glorified when men and women are transformed and they embrace by faith and receive by faith the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that work is so powerful. It is so life changing. You can see them. You can see them. Well, beloved, a question I would pose for you is, do you know, do you have assurance, and this is by faith, that you're no longer condemned? you're no longer guilty, that the guilt that you have incurred and you deserve has been fully and finally removed in Christ and through his sacrifice for those who believe. But so important is to think, are you at risk maybe in often overlooking the practical implications of this truth? that even as Scripture says, God's Word says in Ephesians 2, verse 10, that you are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works. Or in Titus chapter 2, this grace of God that has appeared bringing salvation. And the most important aspect of what the Scripture says in Titus 2, that it brought salvation. And then it tells us what that bringing of salvation does. In bringing salvation, it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, men should live godly. Denying, rejecting the negative, he pursues the righteous, the positive. And that's what this salvation has brought. And as they are being taught through the teaching process, there's the looking process, looking for future glory. But even as they're looking for the future glory, there's the working process of carrying out good deeds on this earth. That's, that's a justified man. That's a justified woman. It dis we're described by how we walk. Well, there's no time to reflect, so I will just pray. And just meditate deeply, but meditate deeply, first of all, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, fulfilling all of the righteous requirements of the law. But remember, the person in whom that righteous requirement has been fulfilled, has been accomplished, is a man or a woman whose life is in accordance to the work of the blessed Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we come to you. We must always admit and confess our inadequacies. We are not able, and uh, honestly, God, prior to salvation, we were unwilling. 
we are so grateful that you graciously moved upon our hearts uh, toward pursuing righteousness by, first of all, saving us. And in saving us, you've also given us a righteousness that is not our own, but you've granted us uh, the desire to pursue a righteousness, a right standard of living that is in accordance to your very divine character. We dare not dismiss that, nor should we be guilty of putting one before the other, the priorities in what your son has done. And it's in that we rejoice, and we live in accordance to his accomplished work as the life-giving, power-granting Spirit of God informs us from your word, but, Father, he transforms us by his power. What a glorious blessing we have. May we be people who are willing and, and Lord, joyfully, anxiously, as it were, pursue righteousness so that you may be praised through us and glorified and that we may be more and more like Christ, your Son, which is your very purpose. Because in Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, we are reflecting who you are day by day as we pursue Christ-likeness and what riches, what honor, what praise we give to you as we do so. May we be motivated, but also be encouraged that the Spirit works to accomplish this in us. To you be all of the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. have been paid in full There's no condemnation here I live in the good of this My Father has
he's done in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, his son. To all of our guests this morning, we do pray that your time has been an encouragement and that the Lord has spoke to you from his sacred and from his holy word. Amen. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. You are dismissed.